after experiencing persecution in Manchester, England. There were all kinds of different grouplets that flowed into the American colonies because thanks to the influence of Penn and some of his contemporaries, the colonies very, very early on had developed a reputation for religious freedom. And it's remarkable that this kind of news would travel back and forth over the, across the Atlantic. I mean, in the early years of its existence, a place like Philadelphia consisted of a few hundred houses, and yet people did hear word of these things. There were trade routes and things like that. And, and as news would travel, more and more groups were attracted to US soil. All of this feeds directly into what we're gonna talk about tonight, which is some of the history, but also some of the practical applications of positive thinking. Because the whole idea that your thoughts contribute very directly to what you experience and to the things that come into your life. In a certain sense, it seems like an idea that's always been with us to some greater or lesser degree. We're told to think positive, have a good attitude, be confident, look on the bright side. And that kind of advice can seem so ordinary, so workaday, so elementary. It seems like something that's always been with us, but it really hasn't. The idea that an attitude makes a concrete difference, not only in terms of how we get along with one another, not only in terms of whether we are an appealing person to be around, but in terms of the actual concrete things that happen to us, that's a new idea. And that idea grew out of some of the ferment and the religious experimentation that occurred right here <coughs> on American soil not very long ago. And it's an idea that we exported throughout the rest of the world. <clears throat> now, when you study history, you find that people across vast stretches of time and geography sometimes have similar ideas. But that doesn't mean that they're necessarily part of some uninterrupted family tree. You know, some people will say that the positive thinking principle, which basically is that thoughts are causative, this notion that thoughts are causative. Some will say that, well, you know, that has roots in certain ancient expressions of Egyptian philosophy that came out of a philosophy called Hermeticism that flourished briefly in Alexandria in the generations immediately following Christ. Some will say that you can find corresponding ideas in the Vedic cultures, in the Buddhist cultures, and this is all true. But the American experimenters who formed the positive thinking ideal who created this kind of mental metaphysics, this idea that our mind has actual causative powers, that what we think about most of the time, what we visualize, what thoughts have emotions at the back of them, that these things actually outpicture in some fashion or another into the events that befall us. That's a very American idea, a very contemporary idea, and it's an idea that has completely remade modern life. And it's an idea that people rush to attack as well because they feel it's superficial. They feel it's unrealistic. They feel it's soft-headed. I don't think that's true. I think it's an idea that stood up with remarkable sturdiness in a variety of ways, some of them very subtle and some more obvious. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to write this history. Because if we think of the power of positive thinking as something that's just a philosophy of refrigerator magnets and page-a-day calendars, or tiresome advice, or, you know, on posters of kittens, you know, hanging onto a tree branch, being told to hang in. We miss a whole dramatic root work of our own metaphysical history, and we miss a set of ideas that have become so influential across so many fields that we've forgotten their source. And we also miss an opportunity for our own personal experimentation. I want to give a quick history of where the positive thinking idea came from, where this idea that thoughts are causative came from in this country. And there are evenings and there are talks where I'll spend a long time on that history, and it'll seem like a Wagnerian opera by the time I'm finished. Um, I happen to love Wagner, so I'm not going to 
make a joke at the expense of fans of Wagner, you know, and say something like, hopefully it'll be more interesting. But um, Mark Twain had a wonderful line about Wagner. He said, Wagner has wonderful moments. It's the quarter hours I could do without. <laughs> so, <laughs> tonight I will exclude the quarter hours, and I will try to tell you the history of positive thinking in a series of moments, because I want to make that history clear, but I also want to jog through it somewhat quickly, because the theme of this evening is, does positive thinking work? Is this philosophy, even if it has an interesting history, something that has a claim on sensitive thinking people in the 21st century? I think it does. And I, I want us to get to that point so that we have time to consider it together. In some respects, the philosophy that we identify today as positive thinking, new thought, mental metaphysics, it has its earliest roots in the work of a Viennese occult healer named Franz Anton Mesmer, who became very popular in the royal courts of Europe for a brief period of time, starting in the late 1770s. Mesmer had a theory, which I would say was a kind of occult or esoteric theory, but which he saw as a theory that was very much in line with the march of rational progress at the time, the late Enlightenment era. And it was this, that all of life was suffused by an invisible energy, an invisible ethereal fluid, which he called animal magnetism. And that if you could place an individual into a trance state, into a trance that later came to be known as what we call hypnotism, but at the time was called a mesmeric trance, if you could place a person into a trance state, the mesmerists could manipulate their animal magnetism, manipulate this invisible bodily fluid, and cure them of ailments or diseases, increase their sense of bodily wellness, give them a new sense of physical vitality. People would suffer from ailments all the time in the Enlightenment age with no availability of medical care whatsoever, and lots of people especially in royal courts and salons in Paris, said that Mesmer's trance states and his manipulation of their animal magnetism had healed them of diseases and ailments that had resisted years of treatment. Now, Mesmer was a greatly controversial figure, and he was held in great suspicion by King Louis XVI, who chaired a royal commission to investigate him which was actually headed by Benjamin Franklin, who at the time was America's ambassador to France. And in 1884, this royal commission, appointed by Louis XVI, just a few years before he was toppled in the French Revolution. 1784. I'm sorry? 1784 or 1884? 17, 1784. Um, just a few years before the French Revolution, um, the Franklin Commission issued its report to the king and concluded that Mesmer was a fake and was a fraud, and that there did seem to be some healings that occurred among people who were under these mesmeric trances, but they were all in the imagination. That sullied and damaged Mesmer's reputation. He would never recur, uh, uh, he would never recover from the condemnation of the Franklin Commission, but the commission left unanswered and even unaddressed its most tantalizing point, and it was this. If these cures were all in the imagination, as the commission report put it, well, why should anything be happening at all? Why should there be any cures? Why should there be anything ephemeral to report? The commission made the mistake of conflating the word imagination, which was actually a well-chosen word in some ways, with fantasy. But they weren't saying it was fantasy. They were saying that there was no existence of animal magnetism. That much they felt certain of. But when they said it was happening in the imagination, they stopped at the threshold of the most intriguing question. What Mesmer was actually doing, and what I think some of his first generation of students grasped in a way that he didn't, was that he was struggling to come up with a terminology and a set of methods to tap the powers of the subconscious mind. 
He called it animal magnetism. We didn't possess a psychological vocabulary yet. Terms like subliminal mind or subconscious mind or unconscious mind, they wouldn't be heard until the early 1880s. This was a century before the Western world even began to mold the clay of a psychological vocabulary. Mesmer's students, his best students, some of whom later traveled to America after the French Revolution, persecution swept so many different parts of the society in France that some of Mesmer's best students were jailed, were persecuted. There was a kind of a witch hunt atmosphere and people interested in all kinds of philosophies that didn't coalesce with whatever the dominant political strains were from one season to the next experienced persecution. That included some of Besmer's best students. Now some of them came to feel that the master was wrong about the existence of this animal magnetism, about the existence of this invisible ethereal fluid. And yet his methods were working. And they began to struggle with some of the earliest attempts to describe the existence of an unseen mind, a mind that had effects on our bodies, effects on our consciousness, effects on our sense of well-being, but that it wasn't the same mind that we used to chop wood, to plan out where to dig a well, to plan a trip. It was a different mind. It was a mind we didn't see. And it's extraordinary to read their diaries and their letters. They're sometimes using spiritual language. They're sometimes using occult language. They're distancing themselves from theories of animal magnetism, but they are trying to come up with this invisible force which a hundred years later, more than a hundred years later, people began to refer to as the subconscious mind, the unconscious mind, but that medical authorities had no real glimmer of at that time. They also found, Mesmer students, that when you put people into this mesmeric trance, what we now today call a hypnotic trance, sometimes it would seem to expand the psychical capacities of people's minds. There were patients who said that they were having out-of-body experiences where they were able to travel in some sort of ethereal state to other locales, other countries. I appreciate that spooky music coming up. Just at this moment. We planned that. Um, it's, there'll be all kinds of effects over the years. Um, and, uh, some patients described the capacity of some kind of clairvoyant perception where they said that their minds could travel not only out of body but into other people's bodies and identify diseased organs and diagnose diseases. Some some patients of Mesmer and his students were able to speak in foreign tongues and languages that they had never learned when they were in these mesmeric trance states. So there were all kinds of unusual things going on, but a lot of this progress, a lot of this study, a lot of this experimentation got cut short by the French Revolution. But fortunately, in the generations ahead, some of Mesmer's students were able to travel across the Atlantic and come to, the, to America, where in the early 19th century, in the decades immediately following the French Revolution, there was a crying need for alternative therapies, alternative means of healing. The state of American medicine throughout a lot of the 19th century, really quite, quite close to the end of the century, was just horrible. It's not as if medicine in general at that time was filled with effective and beneficent therapies, but the state of affairs was particularly poor in the US. American doctors in the first half of the 19th century and pretty well beyond, really pretty close until the 1890s, very frequently were using methods that today we would think of as just being medieval in nature. There was a basic belief that disease could be found in bodily fluids, and that if you could drain the body of fluids, you could promote wellness. So American doctors, barely even deserving of the title at the time, they would use things like bleeding people with leeches. They would give people ingestions of narcotics, toxins that were laced with mercury, which caused the body to 
excessively sweat to salvate. They would create open or weeping wounds. And some of these things, all of which were designed in one way or another to cause draining of bodily fluids, were more damaging and more debilitating than tuberculosis or whatever the illness was that brought the individual to a doctor in the first place. One of the people who was experiencing the harmful effects of what was called heroic medicine at the time was a clockmaker living in the state of Maine named Phineas Quimby. In the early 1830s, Quimby, who had been born at the start of the century, was suffering from tuberculosis, and he had been taking this medication called calomel, which was basically a, a mercury-based compound that would cause excessive salivating, but it would also cause disfigurement of the jaw and teeth to fall out, and he was just experiencing horrible effects from basically this treatment of mercury poisoning that was doing nothing to relieve his tuberculosis. And one day, he went for this kind of raucous horse and buggy ride throughout the main countryside. And his horse kind of got away from him and began to run up and down different hills and charge through meadows. And the experience was frightening, but it was also very exciting. And he later recorded in his notes that after experiencing this bodily excitement, this lifting of mood growing out of this raucous carriage ride, the symptoms of his tuberculosis seemed to lift. He felt better. And this feeling of improved wellness stayed with him for a fairly long time. And Quimby, this clockmaker by trade, began to ponder the question of whether an improvement in our moods, an improvement in our spirits, also corresponds with a feeling of bodily wellness. Different lecturers who were versed in mesmerism began to tour through New England in the 1830s, that decade. And when Quimby learned about mesmerism, he felt that it confirmed the connection that he instinctively arrived at between the mood and the state of your body. Quimby met a young man in Maine in the late 1830s named Lucius Burkmar, who was 17 years old. And he began to work with Lucius at sort of an occult variant of mesmerism that had been going on back in Europe. He put Lucius into a trance state. And Lucius was said to have some kind of clairvoyant ability when he was placed into a trance. And he could see into the bodies of patients, identify diseased organs, and prescribe herbal or botanical remedies, usually in the form of teas, to treat the patients. And lots of people throughout New England and the southern portion of Canada, where they toured around, reported experiencing relief or recovery through this regimen of Lucius, the 17-year-old boy, going into a trance state, clairvoyantly diagnosing them, and prescribing these herbal teas. But Quimby noticed that very often the treatments that were administered to the patients were no different from ordinary botanical treatments that had been given to them earlier at one point or another by a local physician. And it came to feel that the relief that people were experiencing did not have to do with whatever clairvoyant abilities Lucius possessed and did not have to do with the herbal teas that were administered to them because those things didn't differ from things that they had tried and failed with earlier. He came to feel that it was the confidence aroused in the patient that was making the difference. And he came to the conclusion in his notes, man's happiness is in his belief. And he meant it in the most literal sense. So Quimby stopped working with Lucius Burkmar. He stopped administering botanical remedies and teas and so forth. And he would sit down and he would try to come up with methods of arousing people's confidence in their own ability to recover. And he did this for years and years until his death in early 1866. And he came to feel that the patient's very confidence in his ability to recover would make the critical difference in whether he or she would. Now again, this is still a period of time where people had very, very little in the way of actual medicine that we would recognize to draw upon. 
And there were hundreds of people who left behind letters and diaries and journals and letters to newspapers claiming that Quimby had cured them. It's very difficult from our standpoint today to always know what was going on. There was a mayor of the town of Bath, Maine, who said Quimby had cured him of total blindness. He wrote to a newspaper about this. It's not easy to know what was always going on in the lives of these people. But he would see people almost every day, probably for the last decade of his life. And in so doing, he amassed literally thousands of patients. And there were many testimonies left behind, not all of them uniformly positive, but many saying that these confidence treatments of his had cured them. One of his patients, starting in the early 1860s, was a young woman named Mary Baker Eddy, who later founded the religion of Christian science. And Eddy uh, was suffering from an undiagnosed spinal disorder, came to Quimby at a time when she, was, she had been widowed while carrying a child. Uh, she had a second marriage that broke up. She was married to a philandering dentist who managed to get himself taken prisoner during the Civil War by the Confederacy, even though he actually wasn't a soldier. He was foolish enough to go sightseeing on an active battlefield at Bull Run. And so the Confederacy naturally assumed this must be a spy, because they couldn't imagine that anyone would be enough of an idiot to go sightseeing on an active battlefield. But that's what he did. And so she was without a husband. She had been unable to care for her child because she was suffering from ill health. Her child uh, was later adopted by servants of, of the Eddie family in New Hampshire. The servants who had adopted the child when he was 11 years old told him, lied to him, that his mother was dead and they moved away with him to Minnesota. They didn't want him to fight to stay behind. She was not to see the boy again until he was in his 30s. I mean, this was the kind of brutality, of course, that, that, people, that people had to live with. And this was a woman who came from a a not unprosperous farming background, but when you get into the history of what people experienced in the early Victorian age in this country and elsewhere, they just had no options. They had no options. There was no normative medical care. There was no one to fall back on. If you were widowed or suffered an accident or suffered a misfortune, your list of places to turn to was very, very short. So. When someone like Quimby was offering these kind of treatments, where he felt that the redirection of the mind through uses of prayer, affirmation, encouragement, that you possessed some inner agency that could provide a cure, he was providing an extraordinary alternative for people in a world where there were very, very few. There were very few avenues outside of family, church life, local commerce. He provided an opening where no opening existed. And she was enthralled with him. But she later branched off into her own directions. And through her own remarkable search and study of scripture and personal experimentation, she published a book in 1875 called Science and Health, which formed the basis for her Church of Christian Science, which she would open at the end of that decade. And her outlook in some ways was ignited by Quimby's experiments, but it was entirely original. Her outlook was that the human mind wasn't an agency of divine power. It was an agency of illusion. It was a, it was a kind of filter that kept us from understanding the true nature of reality, which was the goodness and beneficence of God, the great divine mind which permeated all things. And it was the human mind, human thoughts, that were the seed of all illness and violence and prejudice. And that if we could cleanse the doors of perception, as William Blake put it, see the illusory nature of our own thoughts, the great divine mind of God, with its healing properties, could make itself known to us. Now, people hear that sometimes, and they say, wow. That actually sounds a lot like things that you find in the Vedas. That sounds a lot like Hinduism. But this was a woman, and I think there was a heroic dimension to Eddie that our culture has never come to terms with. This was a woman who, 
was completely on her own, experimenting with religious ideas and having no resource other than a, a King James translation of the Bible. You know, we overestimate sometimes the materials and the ideas that were available to people at this time. They didn't have literature and spiritual ideas of other nations to draw upon. Um, the first English translation of the Tao Te Ching, the great Chinese ethical work, was not made until 1838. The year Ralph Waldo Emerson published his first series of essays, 1841, there were only four copies of an English version of the Bhagavad Gita here in the United States. One was in the library at Harvard. One was in Ralph Waldo Emerson's private library. He would lend it out sometimes to Henry David Thoreau and other people in that area. And two were in private hands. So it's not as if Mary Baker Eddy or her contemporaries living in the rural town of Bow, New Hampshire had anywhere to go to learn about Buddhism or Vedic ideas. They might have encountered some of these ideas once removed in the essays of Emerson. But these were people out completely on their own. And they were coming up with philosophies. They were coming up with ideas that had motivated and been at the root of religious cultures that at that point were many thousands of years old. And they were coming up with the grapplings toward an early expression of the workings of the subconscious mind, which again, still wouldn't be heard of in intellectual life for another 50 years. Now you can see in Quimby's notes, which are very broken and haphazard and voluminous, he'll talk about the faculty of some invisible mind, which seemed to him to be some kind of agency of power. And Eddie will talk about the existence of a divine mind at the back of workaday life. They were absolutely convinced that the world that we see and feel day to day, the floorboards underneath our feet, were not all there is. This was a radical idea. You didn't hear this idea in Calvinist Protestantism. You didn't hear this idea in Lutherism, Methodism, that, that, that the world that we lived in not, not just was a world that was under the heavens, but was this kind of illusory world that concealed from us some deeper, more vital, more fundamental truth. One of the people who began to open up the Western mind to the possibilities of there being this unseen world was a Swedish scientist and mystic named Emanuel Swedenborg, who lived and worked chiefly in the latter part of the 1700s. And his work got translated into English and began to gain popularity for the first time in 1845. So again, you, know, you can see it's just in mid-century that people are starting to gain access to some of these ideas. And people who were into the ideas of Swedenborg developed a natural sympathy for the kinds of things that Quimby and Mary Baker Eddy were working with, this whole idea of a mental healing, of a mind cure, of a divine science that one could access through the mind, but that involved cosmic or ethereal laws. People who were into Swedenborg liked those ideas because they seemed to them like a very practical application of what Swedenborg was getting at. Swedenborg would go into a kind of a trance state himself. Nowadays, in the 21st century, we would call Swedenborg a kind of a channeler or a psychic. But those words weren't in such currency at that time, obviously. Swedenborg would go into these trance states, and he would report being able to travel astrally to different planets and dimensions of the afterlife. And he maintained in these vast, voluminous metaphysical epics that he wrote after coming out of his trance states, he maintained that we live in two worlds. We live in the material world that we know and that we experience in our senses day to day, but that there's also this invisible cosmic world. And everything that goes on in our day to day lives is mirrored in this cosmic world. And in fact, we catch glimpses of it in our dreams, in our intuitions, 
in our capacity to see and experience things that go on when we're not in our ordinary state of workaday consciousness. And that everything that goes on in that cosmic world, whether it's a thought or a statement or an intuition or a dream image, mirrors in our actual workaday world. So people who were into Swedenborg, and one of them was a Massachusetts minister named Warren Felt Evans, who also worked with Quimby for a brief period of time, they felt that Quimby's ideas, these mental healing methods, these mesmeric trances, this attempt to use the workings of an unseen mind, were a practical application of Swedenborg's ideas, that the heavens weren't just a place that we went when we died, but that there was this mirror world, this unseen world, and its effects could be felt on us and through us through the proper directing of our thoughts. And right there, starting around late 1850s, early 1860s, when all these people in New England are working together, Quimby, Warrenfeld Evans, Mary Baker Eddy, right there is the birth of the whole positive thinking thesis, this whole idea that would later come to sweep the entire nation, that our thoughts are a capillary of some sort of divine influence, that the work-a-day world that we live in is not all there is, and that we participate in a life that's more than just physical, and that we're not at the mercy entirely of forces from this unseen world, but we can participate with them through visualization, through prayer, through the determined redirecting of our thoughts, through an emotionalized idea, through the upswelling of confidence, anything that we can do to tap the visual, visualizing powers, the conceptualizing powers of our mind can serve as an agency of force. That was what the New England mental healers believed. And as life marched on in the late 19th century, their followers came to feel that if these things were true in the area of health, they could be true in other areas as well, such as money, relationships, careers. If you could help use the mind to determine what happens to your body, maybe the mind could determine what happens to you in all these other walks of life, including commerce, the great American obsession. Now the fact is, by the early 1890s, Johns Hopkins Medical School opened its doors, and Johns Hopkins began with a determined mission to not only improve medical care throughout America, but to standardize medical licensing from state to state. Because even by the early 1890s, especially in frontier areas like Tennessee and other parts of the nation, people were still getting treated by these kind of backwoods <laughs> physicians who, again, you know, they would use things like the application of leeches, the creating of bleeding wounds, things that you would find it hard to believe were going on still in the latter part of the 19th century. But Johns Hopkins began to normalize medical practice throughout America. They imported teaching methods from Europe requiring that students serve residencies and participate in some kind of research. Uh, they successfully encouraged uh, the American medical community to stop the application of leeches and things like that. So we took all kinds of step forwards in medicine in the early 1890s. Um, physicians were learning about germ theory as it emerged from what was called the Paris School, which was Louis Pasteur and his circle of researchers who were discovering that many diseases were based in microbial infections, that sanitation made a great difference in avoiding infection and the spread of disease. So American medicine began to revolutionize. And it's not that the mental healers or the Christian scientists went away. Many of them continued their practice 
But they began to edge more and more, especially by the mid to late 1880s, into this question of money, of whether the mine could be used as some sort of a wealth attracting magnet. And it didn't happen overnight that suddenly the whole country fell in love with the think and grow rich approach. It took well over a generation and the birth of the prosperity gospel took about 30 or 40 years to come to look the way that we know it today in terms of books like Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill or in terms of the prosperity gospel that you will hear preached sometimes from the pulpit of some of the largest evangelical mega ministries in America whose pastors would be outraged by the suggestion that they shared any kind of a family tree lineage with occult thinkers like Mesmer or with these bizarre experimenters like Phineas Quimby. They've never heard of these people in most cases because the language of the mental healing movement, the language that later rejiggered itself in the prosperity gospel has become so widespread that the source material is almost completely forgotten. The figures that I'm describing to you, Warren Felt Evans, Phineas Quimby, even Mary Baker Eddy, who's the most famous among them, other people who I haven't even mentioned, uh, like Andrew Jackson Davis, who was known as the Poughkeepsie Seer, who was a trans medium in the Hudson Valley. All these people created the positive thinking thesis, and none of these people, with the exception of Mary Baker Eddy, is read today anywhere. They are invisible in our culture. As source material, they're completely forgotten. And yet, a whole foundation of our culture rests on the shoulders of these people. Now, when the mental healers began to think about using the mind as a money magnet, they weren't thinking, as I alluded earlier, in the think and grow rich mold that we know today. These were people who were part of what became known as the progressive era. They believed that you could use the mind's causative powers as a tool for social equity. The first mental healer, the earliest person in this history that I've personally been able to identify who started talking about using mind cure methods to attract money was a woman named Frances Lord. She was an English woman, a radical suffragist activist, an advocate of progressive education methods, and, as it happens, the first English translator of the plays of Henrik Ibsen. She was invited to America in 1885 by the suffragist Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who at the time was embarking on a project called the Woman's Bible, which was a reinterpretation and annotation of scripture to reveal the female influence on the development of the Judeo-Christian tradition that Elizabeth Cady Stanton felt had been written out of scripture and written out of our religious education. So she was enlisting women who had a theological background to help her in this project. She invites Frances Lord to come and stay at her house in Tenafly, New Jersey. Anybody here from Tenafly? <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Radical roots in Tenafly. And Lord comes to America, and she soon discovers the mental healing movement. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton writes in a letter, she started to embark upon psychical research and I could get no more work out of her. And Lord travels to Chicago where she hooks up with a woman named Emma Curtis Hopkins who at one time had been a student of Mary Baker Eddy's. They had a falling out. Hopkins was teaching mental healing classes independently on her own. And Lord becomes absolutely entranced with the mental healing culture as she discovers it in Chicago, in San Francisco. And she produces a book, a vast book, of mental healing methods in which she includes a chapter on using the mind to attract wealth. But she's absolutely adamant that this isn't for the purposes of building yourself up as some big magnate or spender or somebody who wants to one-up your neighbors, but it's to be used to help even the playing field 
between women who have no independent financial means or immigrants or working people. It's one tool among others to be included in the activist tool belt as she saw it. And for years after this, the prosperity gospel was seen among its advocates exactly in that mold, as something that was a tool of equity, a kind of sort of metaphysical social justice. And so there's a Quaker minister, who some of you have heard of, who in 1911 publishes a book called The Science of Getting Rich. This was Wallace D. Wattles. Now this book, The Science of Getting Rich, became a big bestseller in the year 2007. It was number one on the Business Week bestseller list because it formed a centerpiece of the book and movie The Secret. And so, of course, Waddles, who was a great communicator, gives his book this alluring title, The Science of Getting Rich. And it sounds, well, you know, I mean, to the American mind, to the American instinct, that's exciting stuff. And a whole new generation of people in the 21st century are embracing this forgotten Quaker minister in his book, The Science of Getting Rich. But if you read the book carefully, and I was absolutely shocked when I first encountered the thing, because I hadn't heard of it until the secret returned it to the public mind. If you read it carefully, it has an unmistakable thread of Marxist language running throughout the book. And I go over it, chapter and verse, in my new book. Waddles was a Christian socialist, and he believed that these mental healing ideas, which were taking shape in a new way into the prosperity gospel, could be used to help bring about a kind of cooperative, non-competitive, utopian socialist revolution, where all people would live by mental creativity and cooperation, and where we would live in this sort of gentle, non-exploitative utopia. That was his vision. And the people around him and his contemporaries, his publisher was a Massachusetts suffragist named Elizabeth Town. She was also a political activist. She became the first female town alderman in Holyoke, Massachusetts in 1926. She also ran for mayor. She became one of the first female candidates for mayor in New England at that time. She and her husband were very active in the early campaigns of Teddy Roosevelt and the founding of the Progressive Party. Wallace Waddles himself ran for Congress on the ticket of the US Socialist Party and ran for mayor of the town of Elwood, Indiana, which was his hometown, also on the ticket of the Socialist Party. This was in 1908, 1909. There were many people who were involved in radical politics who were also experimenting with mental metaphysics at that time. Another of them, and one of my favorites, who I write about in this book and in my previous book, Occult America, was Marcus Garvey, the pioneering black nationalist. Garvey, Garvey's speeches and writings were absolutely laced with the language of mental metaphysics. He was secretive about his sources, and he didn't disclose them very often. But there were only two people Garvey mentioned publicly as writers who he recommended reading. One was a man named Albert Hubbard, who's not well remembered today, but who was quite famous at the turn of the century. He was a crusading social journalist, and he wrote a little motivational essay called A Message to Garcia, which was hugely popular at the time. And the other figure, who Garvey publicly recommended, and whose work he would read out loud at his rallies, was the poet Ella Wheeler Wilcox, who is not well remembered today, but you'll know her most famous lines, and they are, laugh and the world laughs with you. Weep and you weep alone. That's what she was famous for. Garvey loved her. She also was a student of Emma Curtis Hopkins. Albert Hubbard's wife, Alice, had also taken classes with Emma Curtis Hopkins. It's difficult for people to understand this today, but it was a very exciting time. That generation that existed at the turn of the century that was into avant-garde radical politics, very often they were also into avant-garde spirituality. There was a marriage in this country of people who were into experimenting with different spiritual ideas and who were into the politics of protest. I mean, it existed really throughout the whole latter part of the 19th century. In my previous book, I go into the joint history of the spiritualist movement 
and the suffragist movement. They were absolutely intertwined, like one strand of DNA. The people who were interested in social reform were also experimenting with all these avant-garde spiritualities, and that's where the prosperity gospel comes from. That's where it comes from. So if you flick on the tube one Sunday morning and there's Joel Osteen saying, I want to keep getting better and better, those are his actual roots. Now, many of those names are forgotten today. We remember Marcus Garvey, but nobody thinks of him as a metaphysical figure. That's a gap in our history. If people have heard of Wallace Waddles, they might know him as, oh, that guy from The Secret who wrote The Science of Getting Rich. But he won't be thought of as a figure of political protest. It happened that as time passed, the New Thought Movement, as it came to be called, that came to be the umbrella name under which some of the positive thinking philosophies were known, it did develop a more individualistic social outlook. And the books that reached the greatest heights of fame and that are with us still are books like Napoleon Hill's uh, Think and Grow Rich, which was actually preceded by an earlier work of his in 1928 called The Law of Success. And by that time, books with titles like The Law of Success or Think and Grow Rich, uh, any book that prescribed a mental road to money attraction, tended to have shed the social concerns of that earlier generation. So that by the time the Reverend Norman Vincent Peale in 1952 wrote his greatly popular book, The Power of Positive Thinking, which is really the book that made positive thinking into a phrase heard throughout the country, the social aspect of that movement was gone. But its popularity was absolutely bounding. When Peel published The Power of Positive Thinking in 1952, he created a book that, up until that time, sold more than any other book in American life, with the exception of the Bible. You would find Peel's book in homes where you wouldn't find a lot of other books. And Peel was an extraordinary figure who I have a lot of admiration for. It became an intellectual vogue in the 1950s, which never went away, to dump on figures like Norman Vincent Peel as being these superficial, smiley-faced ciphers, these purveyors of a spirituality of optimism with no ethical core with no capacity to deal with life in all of its suffering and all of its difficulty. What Peel did was very American in nature, and it has something to do with why his popularity has never waned. Peel was a conservative Methodist minister who was placed in charge of a shrinking and ailing Dutch Reform congregation, not too far from where we are tonight. That's Marble Collegiate Church at Fifth Avenue and 29th Street. And if anybody asked Peel what was his background, where were his ideas from, he would insist that he was exactly what he appeared to be, a conservative Methodist minister, the keeper of a respectable Protestant pulpit on the east side of Manhattan, and that his ideas were from scripture. The fact is, that wasn't entirely the full picture. Peel was a great religious experimenter, and he read very, very deeply into all the metaphysics that I've been talking about. And he came to believe that these ideas were true, this notion that the mind is some sort of agency of influence, and that the mind and prayer, and that our emotionalized thoughts could carry through with some causative influence into our lives. He believed that. But as a man of scripture, he said to himself, well, if that's true, then it must also be found in the Bible. So he went to the Bible, and he reprocessed all these mystical ideas through scriptural stories and parables and precepts. And from that intellectual journey, he created his book, The Power of Positive Thinking. If you read that book today, you'll not only find a book that's filled with serviceable ideas, 
but that is remarkably Christian in tone. Some people from the New Age culture will approach the power of positive thinking and think, wow, this is going to be great. And they're a little bit taken aback at how conservative a Christian tone also permeates the book. But you will find in it, side by side with that, all kinds of telltale language from the positive thinking movement. He'll talk about, you know, he'll use phrases like, as a man thinketh, so is he, which became a very popular phrase in that movement through the influence of a British writer named James Allen. He'll use the phrase, thoughts are things, which another formative figure for the movement, uh, well, it was actually, that, that phrase got its earliest beginnings in Warren Felt Evans, who worked with Quimby. He'll talk about the idea that the body admit, it emits some kind of magnetic prayer power, which is an idea out of mesmerism. And there are some funky passages to the book where he'll talk about sinking your body up with the rhythms of the earth. And he writes, when you go outside, you should lay on the ground and put your ear to the ground and hear everything that's moving inside the earth, the tectonic movements and the bugs and the worms and feel that rhythm of the earth and that's the rhythm of God. Try to sink your body with that. Let me tell you, that was not the standard language of a conservative Methodist minister in the 1950s. <laughs> Peel was more than what he presented to people. And I have to tell you, you know, a lot of people make fun of a figure like Joel Osteen, who is so vastly popular today, has so many millions of fans, but to serious theologians, to evangelical Christians who feel that he doesn't place a great enough emphasis on salvation, to liberal religionists who feel that he's a, a salesman, he gets dumped on everywhere. And, I mean, I, I have my impersonation of him and such, but it's unavoidable. But I like Osteen, and I don't think, I don't think he's the cipher that he's made out to be in the media. And I don't think he's the cipher that he's made out to be in the intellectual culture. Um, whenever I'm on an NPR show, the host will always bring up Joel Osteen's name as if, you know, this is the moment to bring on the rodeo clown. We'll all have a chuckle over this, you know, artificial fake guy with this row of per pearly white teeth and his coiffed hair and suits acting like a car salesman. But I won't participate in that. I won't participate in that. I respect Osteen for this reason. He's one of the very, very few people from the world of evangelism who will identify Norman Vincent Peale as having been a source. All the prosperity ministers today and there's a vast number of them who are sometimes explicitly associated with the prosperity gospel, like Benny Hinn or Joyce Meyer. There are some who are more tangentially associated with it, like Pat Robertson and T.D. Jakes. Uh, they command vast audiences, and none of them, if you ask them, will cop to reading Norman Vincent Peale or The Power of Positive Thinking, because Peale today is viewed as a little bit squishy, a little bit suspect. Peel was, in some ways, the conservative minister that he depicted himself to be, but he would talk about things like the music of the spheres and sinking yourself with the rhythms of the earth. He was a fan of a woman named Florence Scobell Shin, who some of you might know. She was a, a New York artist and mystic who wrote a book called The Game of Life and how to play it in 1925. Conservative evangelical ministers don't read figures like Florence Scobell Shin and they don't read people who were influenced by them. So Peel is viewed somewhat suspiciously. But I know through mutual acquaintances that he has identified, that Joel Osteen has identified Peel as a source. And he's one of the few voices in that world who will do so. And he goes further still. He, he kind of brought down this torrent of criticism on himself several years ago within the evangelical world when he sat for an interview on the Larry King show. And Larry King said to him, do you believe that only people who accept Christ can go to heaven? Everybody else is going to hell? And Osteen said, Larry, I can't see what's in another person's heart. And Larry King pressed him on it again and said, but don't you believe? Isn't it part of the outlook of your faith that if you don't accept Christ, you're going to hell? And Osteen again said, Larry, I can't see what's in another person's heart. And evangelicals came down like hell on him for saying that. 
Benny Hinn famously said he wanted to punch him in the nose. <laughs> I want to punch Joe Rostin in the nose, and then I'll pray for forgiveness. You can find this on YouTube. <laughs> this is his message. Um, he brought down hell on himself for those comments. And some people will look and say, well, there goes old Joel again, you know, the guy who never wants to take a position on anything, you know, the guy who wants to, to, to appeal to as broad a market as possible, betraying the faith, betraying the theology of salvation. But I actually thought that what Osteen was doing was displaying a determined resistance to engage in this kind of theology of exclusivity, a theology of damnation. Believe me, there's a large enough audience out there so that Joel Osteen doesn't need to cop out on an answer to Larry King in order to get more popular. He caught tremendous hell in the evangelical world for that. But he was displaying something that I think is healthy in American religion, and it comes directly out of the positive thinking imperative, and it's this. As all these different figures became more popular. And as people within the mainstream faiths heard about positive thinking and the mental metaphysics, they began to demand that their own congregations start sounding more and more like some of the healing ideas that were coming out of the positive thinking movement. So by the 1950s and persistently onward, American religion was remade as not only a salvational faith, but a healing faith as well. The salvational aspect didn't go away, but Americans demanded that religion also have a healing component too. And not just bodily healing, not just addiction recovery, but that American religion provide practical answers to career problems, to financial problems, to marriage problems to finding a mate, to getting married, to staying married. A minister like Oral Roberts, who rose to great prominence just in the years following Norman Vincent Peale, he held a very conservative Pentecostal-styled pulpit. But if you actually look at the publications and the sermons and the media output of Roberts until his death four years ago. He too, although in some ways he was seen as a very conservative voice, he reflected this kind of advice-giving, therapeutic, healing quality of faith that came right out of the power of positive thinking. And you go through his magazines, his pamphlets, his articles, his sermons, He's using chapter and verse, chapter and verse of mental metaphysical ideas. He'll write things like, you know, whatever a man thinks he can become, our only limitations are our thoughts. What happens to us in outer life is a reflection of how we view ourselves. These weren't ideas that you found in American Christianity a hundred years ago. They're new ideas that have infused and remade our entire religious culture, from New Age spiritual centers to evangelical megachurches, and they all come out of the positive thinking movement. So I've said enough about the history and the influence of positive thinking. There's one imperative question. Does it work? Does it work? Everything that I'm describing to the ears of many people within journalism, within academia, within the opinion-making culture, would sound like cause for depression. So this superficial, unrealistic spiritual idea has become popular. That's something to be happy about. And if they're right, then this history just deserves to be in a museum case somewhere. It's uh, an odd quirk of American life, maybe very influential. But maybe that's cause for depression. Maybe the fact that American religion has gone down this rabbit hole of metaphysical fantasies is something that we should be embarrassed about. But I think that the positive thinking thesis actually stands up with surprising 
muscularity today. And I would urge people not to be embarrassed out of experimenting with it, identifying it by name, and trying out its ideas in the experience of your own life. I alluded to this earlier. The positive thinking movement in its earliest days began to open doors to our understandings of the subconscious mind before that vocabulary ever existed. And one of the areas of life where its claims are indisputed by anybody in any serious way, to cite one example, is in the area of the placebo effect. Placebo studies have been going on for over a century at this point. And there is absolutely no working consensus on what the placebo effect is. Richard Feynman famously said about quantum physics, which we're going to talk about, anybody who says that they understand it definitely doesn't understand it. Well, the same thing is true with the placebo effect. Anybody who says, well, we know what the placebo effect is. You know, the body releases certain enzymes and um, pain reductive chemicals and such. We understand it. We don't understand it. We don't understand it. Because our questions about the placebo effect right now in the year 2014 are deepening. We are in front of an ever deepening mystery of what the placebo effect is, which I think probably suggests that we're getting somewhere. The fact that hopeful expectancy can result in some kind of feeling of physical wellness on some traceable and substantial scale cannot be reduced to any one thing. If you can show that a feeling of hopeful expectancy, let's say, releases some sort of endorphins or pain reductive enzymes in the body, that may be going on, but that's not the only thing that's going on. That doesn't summarize the mystery for us, and the mystery keeps deepening. In December of 2010, researchers at Harvard Medical School embarked for the first time on a transparent placebo study. They collected a variety of people who were suffering from irritable bowel syndrome and gave them a pill that they told them was an inert substance, was a non-medicinal substance, a sugar pill, in effect. 59% of the participants in the study reported substantial relief, even though they were told up front, guess what we're giving you? Nothing. You are receiving absolutely no medicinal properties whatsoever in this pill. And the results were extraordinary. Why would people experience physical well-being when they are told directly that they're getting a bread pill, a sugar pill, an inert substance. The researchers wisely resisted interpreting their own results. They said, well, we have to study this further. I venture in the book, and I'll venture here, one possibility, which is that belief in the placebo effect, familiarity with the placebo effect, is so widespread in our culture People read about it in Reader's Digest. People hear about it on the news. Some people have had some experience with it. That if you can put people into a setting where they feel that the parameters of the mind are being responsibly and reasonably and safely tested, that alone is enough to trigger this sense of confident, hopeful expectancy. I, I have another. Possibility. Please. You give me something. I know it's nothing. I'm going to just say, okay, this isn't, but I'm going to put a little energy of yeah. my own around it. And, yeah. and that's why I think that experiment worked. Well, anything that seems to arouse yeah. that sense of hopeful possibility in the individual, you know, it's interesting because what the Harvard um, subjects were experiencing, in a way, wasn't vastly different from what Phineas Quimby's patients were experiencing. 150 years earlier. Mm -hmm. And that puts us, now you know, we'll get into the part of our, 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 our discussion this evening where we deal with some of the applications of these ideas. Mm -hmm. That puts us in front of an extraordinary mystery. What is it that's going on? And what is the healing property? Because if we can identify one part of it, let's say the release of bodily chemicals, we haven't identified the whole thing. Should we take a little break and then come back into that? Let's do it. Okay.